Good afternoon, Amber Louise Temple Morphin Layson. Welcome on VH Berries. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here. I am extremely grateful because each of your creation is not just a release, but a groundbreaking event in itself. How are you doing today? Well, after that introduction, I'm doing great. Can you come in every day and just say that when I wake up? That'd be brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm going, going also to add something, which is that the world is watching. Temple Morph in Laysen at dinner, at lunch, and also at breakfast. And I believe that you know exactly where I am heading to. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I would love Amber Temple Morphin Layson to discuss about one of your uh, first projects called Antonio's Breakfast. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Oh, Antonio's breakfast was um, was the moment I realized I wanted to tell longer stories, um, human stories. And, you know, the script was sent to me and I, I produced Antonio's breakfast and the script was sent to me and I read it and I met with the director and I, you know, I fell in love with it. And, and that was my first journey into going from shorter format, which is what I'd worked on in, you know, commercials and, and uh, well, commercials. Um, photography is my other love. So that's why it's, it was always kind of like these minute moments. And then Antonio's breakfast was kind of my, my stepping into, uh, a more narrative world, um, and telling stories. And I, and I realized after that one that I was hooked. Um, you know, and we were very lucky because people recognized um, that it was a very powerful story and a very important story. So that was my first step into, say, dangling my toes into um, storytelling uh, on screen. Absolutely. Amber Temple Morphin Layson, uh, this uh, piece of art uh, called uh, Antonio's Breakfast uh, was your uh, first uh, step into uh, production, but also uh, it raised your interest uh, for your upcoming filmmaking career and to come back to that very powerful uh, storyline. Um, this short film uh, is telling the story of Antonio's and his friends um, because uh, this character is forced uh, with a lot of dilemmas. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you remember from uh, the guilt and uncertainty uh, feelings that uh, this short film is giving us? Well, I think, I think um, to contradict you, less about guilt and more about, you know, the responsibility placed on a, on a, you know, a youngster, a teen, um, that doesn't necessarily have the facilities to deal with it yet. And then social pressure and, and all of those things that we, we forget that a, that a lot of youth have to deal with. So, you know, seeing it through his eyes, um, he was a very special boy is, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, what, sometimes our kids have to go through for us. In addition to those very powerful emotions, you mentioned uh, Amber Temple Morphin Layson that you produced this short film and at a certain time you got the script in front of you. What made you choose and pick that particular story? Oh, I was very human. Yeah, it was very human and um, very powerful. And you never know why stories come to you, but um, that was the first moment where where I, I, I realized I had to tell that story. Um, and there was a great team involved and, and, you know, there were very, very many reasons, but it was just, it was like a calling. So, you know, we, yeah, I, I always say stories come to you, they find you. Um, and that was a great lesson in how that happens. 
absolutely amber temple morphine laser and on the other side of uh, that story i also believe that uh, this moment of the day which is the breakfast might be one of your favorites and something that is very important especially in great britain <laughs> <laughs> They do love a good breakfast in Great Britain. You are you are correct. There's nothing like an English breakfast. What would you say uh, would be the Embers breakfast? Well, I uh, I'm a convert. I'm a I'm a burrito girl now. <laughs> Give me a good burrito any time. Um, I have I have a little um, I had a little superstition, which is on the first day of filming uh, any project. Um, Before we turn over, I have to have had my burrito um, before before that first frame is is kind of captured. So that's my own little superstition. This is, as you just mentioned, Amber Louise Temple Morphine Layson, one of your uh, superstition. And at that time, that short film uh, was shot in a city called uh, Brixton. And I think that if you return to that place right now, you might find uh, your burritos because there are a lot of uh, restaurants, but also I counted 12 coffee shops that are very life-saving. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> it, it's all about, it's all about the coffee. If you, if you can't have decent coffee on the morning of a shoot, I mean, it's just, it's all going to go downhill from there. Absolutely, Amber Temple Morphine Layson. And since the beginning of this conversation, I called you by your full name because you are uh, right now uh, writing a new chapter as a director, uh, directing uh, alone by yourself in solo, if I can use that word, yes. because you, you are also part of a duo uh, that is known as Bert and Bertie. Bertie. Can you tell us a little bit more about this uh, signature and this adventure? Well, interestingly, just after, because Antonio's Breakfast, we were lucky enough to win the BAFTA. And because of that, it started a lot of conversations. And one of the conversation, um, I think literally the morning after the BAFTA, because uh, I had to go back and shoot, um, one of my clients on the shoot uh, pitched me, you know, pitched me a story um, that she was writing. And I loved it. And, and let's just say I had the bug by then. So um, it seemed the natural thing to step into. And it was only when we were kind of pulling the project together that we both wanted to direct it. Um, so, you know, being the producer that I, that I am and, and realizing I wanted to direct, um, I was like, well, let's do it together. And, and that was, that was literally the birth of, of Bert and Bertie because it, everything happened really organically after that. Like we were very creatively aligned and we both had different skill sets. So we kind of filled each other's gaps. And, but most importantly, you know, there weren't really examples of female directors, um, out in the world. So to do it together kind of felt like, uh, you know, anything was possible. Um, and, you know, for 16 years, it, it was like having, you know, someone there that was inside your head. And, and so we went on that journey together. But we we came up with Bird and Birdie because we started calling each other nicknames. Um, and it, it made the crossover from producing to directing easier, that it was just kind of this 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 new kind of not character, but this new persona. Um, so that was kind of a very natural step into, into directing, directing under another name, poking fun as, at the male auteur, um, you know, with men's names. Um, and weirdly, it actually, people thought we were men until they met us. So we'd come over to, to <laughs> it's true. We, we'd, we'd come over to America and, um, we'd walk into a, into a meeting and they'd be like, they'd actually say it, you're a woman. And we're like, we know. Um, <laughs> um, but, but what it meant was weirdly, what it meant was they viewed our work and our short films as, as though we were men. So it was never a question about, well, you know, can Jane do it? Can Jane handle this? It was like, I love that work. 
I want to meet them. And it, and it very weirdly, only when we started coming to meetings, did we realize that this is how women were being treated. This is how female directors were being seen in the industry. So it, it, it did a very interesting thing and it played with that dynamic of, of the acceptance of female di- directors and the female voice. Um, so it was kind of a fun way to come at it. Um, weirdly, it, it wasn't our intention. Um, but it was a, it was a very beautiful advantage that we then turned on its head to just talk about you know, talk about the issue of the voices that are out there, or the lack of voices that are out there. Um, so that's a very long way of saying that's that's where Bird and Birdie kind of started and how it came about. It was uh, Amber Templemore Finlayson, an advantage that you uh, used, and not everyone uh, is made to work as a duo, but this no. was not completely your case because you fitted very well in that uh, workflow. Um, Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the insights of working uh, as a duo? For example, when it comes to say the word action and cut, uh, you need to give me some of the secrets of uh, that uh, success. Oh, well, if I, if I tell you the secrets, I have to kill you. But, um, what I can tell you, no, no, I take that back. I'm not going to kill you. Um, we, uh, yeah, how did we do it? Um, we did a very unusual thing. We would alternate day on day. So one day I would be with the actors and then the next day I would be with the camera. Um, and it sounds insane, but, you know, our prep would be fiercely detailed. And so we always knew where we were going. We knew what we wanted to achieve with the story or the performances. or And so what it actually ended up meaning is that person was with the actors could really be with them and not be pulled away to answer millions of questions that you had to. And then the other person would do camera, production design, costume. And so it became seamless, uh, you know, to, to the extent that, you know, the actors wouldn't have known who directed them one day to the next. Um, and so it worked for us. It's very unusual. <laughs> um, and it seemed to have worked for everyone else. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a fascinating experience and it was fascinating to do it that way. It was fascinating to do it that way. And if I understood correctly, Amber Templemore, Finlayson, um, you were directing one day out of two and uh, you were doing uh, a completely uh, different thing on the day you were off the set. Yes, correct. Well, well, on the set, because you're, you're right there, obviously you become, um, if you're, if you're with the camera, you become the other eye. You become the person that, uh, maybe the blocking isn't working or maybe, you know, there's, there's, there's a part in the script that, that the actor kind of is, isn't finding or, or one of us wasn't finding. And then you had this collaborator, you had this person there that, you know, growing up in the industry, it was really great to have that is to kind of have, it's almost like a security blanket. You know, it's like, is this working? Do I need to change anything? And as long as we were both open to that discussion, uh, which we had to be, that, then it was great because someone always had your back. So there was always another opinion that you trusted. Um, so that's probably why it worked so well for us um, as we were growing up as, as directors. Absolutely, Amber Temple Morphin Layson. Someone else always had your back and you always and often were wearing hats. Yes, we were. Uh, we, uh, uh, I mean, I have, I have an extensive hat collection. This is, this is the hat of the moment, but, um, it, it's kind of fun because there's also something about, you know, when actors put on costumes, you know, they, they, they become their characters. And for me, it was always when I put my hat on on the morning, it's like I'm directing today. There was something, there was something about that, that I, that I love. And, and more than that, even, even more importantly, if you're having a bad hair day, doesn't matter. No one can see it. So it's perfect. It is perfect to always have a great hairstyle in any circumstances. Thank you. And 
I would love uh, Amber Temple Morphin Layson to discuss about your journey that started in a city uh, called Johannesburg in South Africa. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Oh, I guess the short version is um, I was very lucky. I grew up on a farm outside of Johannesburg, uh, very, very remote. Um, so everything that was going on in the country at that time, you know, was is I grew up during apartheid. Um, as a child, I didn't know about it. And my parents were, you know, really great in that way because you, because of their kind of uh, beliefs uh, in human beings rather than what the color of your skin is, we grew up very protected and we grew up very um, protected from what was going on. The first time that I I actually knew about apartheid was when we had moved into the suburbs, so off of the farm at 13. And then so growing up with that discussion, growing up uh, – realizing what had been happening in the country that I loved and then finding out what I could do about that. And I think what ended up um, moving into filmmaking and storytelling was how do we change the story to include everyone? You know, that's, that's kind of what I learned from that experience because, you know, I don't agree with what happened, very strongly don't agree. And one of the reasons I left was because I felt I could do more by by being outside of that system and that changing system and um, by changing the stories that we're telling, you know, on a global scale. And, you know, there's a version that I could have stayed and done that, but there's a version where I do that from the outside and, and I do that by, by trying to tell stories that are inclusive and human um, and respectful um, and filled with humanity. So, so I think that really set me growing up there Having the freedom of a childhood like that really set me on this course, um, and I'm incredibly grateful for it. Absolutely. Amber Louise Temple Morphin Layson, those early days in uh, Johannesburg in South Africa definitely told you a lot about uh, humanity. And a chapter that came after is the one in London. Hmm. Yes, it is. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, those days moving from a continent to another one? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a very interesting. And what I've found out on this journey is, you know, leaving a country where I left with a lot of guilt for, for what happened for, you know, over 50 years, but also a guilt in leaving, uh, feeling like a true outsider and, and wanting to just shake that there was part of me that wanted to shake that part past um that I came from but but actually what London taught me is that there are people in London from all over the world where everyone has their own story you know and they were all they were all trying to find out who they are and they, they, they but what I what I realized about London was that my difference was my greatest strength you know, being different, being from where I, I was from, I started out being ashamed of it. But actually what I learned over 20 years and learned as becoming a storyteller is that my difference is what makes me. And having been part of that is what makes me. And what it's what helps me make my decisions these days when I'm choosing what kind of stories do I want to tell. You know, stories that have consequence um, and hope. You know, those two things, while also being hugely entertaining um, so that lots of people will see them. Um, so, so that growing up in South Africa directly informed who I found I was in London um, and has led me, as we know, every, every step of our lives, every step of the way leads us where we are today. Um, and, and so London gave me that opening up, the, the learning about the world. The, I was so in awe of the city and the history and the, the diversity of the people in London. It, it was, it was unbelievable to me. And I'm so grateful, um, that I went, that, that I, that I ended up there. I ended up back there. My great grandmother was, um, British. And I feel very fortunate that I, that I had those 20 years that taught me about the, the, the scale of humanity and the, and the diversity of people that I met and, and the different cultures and the conversations. And, you know, they directly inform the stories that I want to tell today. Um, so I'm very grateful. 
in definitive Amber Temple Morph in Layson, we could fit those 20 years of experiences in a silo. We could fit 20 years into a silo, <laughs> yes. Well, actually, it's, it's 300 years into the silo. Um, and, and, I, and I'm so, so glad you said that because going back now um, to do silo season two, um, DM me for spoilers. Just kidding. Um, but going back, back there, um, as a, as a solo director, um, and, and living in the area I used to live in when I lived there. And there's something really, um, familiar and it's like a warm hug going back to London and being reminded of, of, you know, the, the people that I fell in love with, um, in London and, and being reminded that of all the different stories and everything that people are going through and being as close as we are currently to the Ukraine war and, you know, the activity around that. And, and I miss that about London. I, I deeply miss that about having lived in London, but going back there, working on such a incredible production, um, but also living in my old neighborhood and, you know, doing the things I used to do. It, it's the same me, but it's a different me. Um, so I, I'm, I'm enjoying being there at the minute. Obviously, I'm not there right now because of the, the strike, which is incredibly important. Um, but we'll be back there soon. And I'm really looking forward to going back. Um, so fingers crossed it's soon um, that we, we come to some agreement on these, these strike deals. It is you, but also a different you in definitive. Uh, you are solo on silo. <laughs> yes, I am solo on silo. I know. It really works, doesn't it, as a catchphrase? Um, yeah, and, and, you know, the, the stories, the stories they're telling on silo are, are stories that are relevant today about, you know, needing to be more aware Um as humans, um, and, and how do we maintain our, our humanity moving forward? Um, you know, there's a lot of big questions that we're asking on Silo season two, as we did in season one, but, um, there's a, there's a lot of greater conversations that are happening beyond what's on the script and what we shoot day to day. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that. Absolutely. Amber Temple Morphin Layson, there are questions, but also symbols. And we just mentioned uh, just before the fact of uh, storing 300 years of uh, lifetime into a silo. What does the symbol of a silo means for you? Um. Well, we, we have this symbol in the silo, which is the nautilus shell, the spiral shell, which is obviously echoed in the spiral of the staircase. Um, it's a very feminine symbol. Um, you know, the circle has always been more feminine. Um, but the nautilus shell is about, is about the universe and the flow of the universe. So, so beyond the day to day, um, you know, trials and tribulations that our characters are going through, there, there's a greater femininity to the show that I haven't seen. Um, in, in many shows before. And, and so that, that Nautilus shell is something that, that we keep going back to. We keep using that symbol of the, of the flow. Um, obviously season two, ah, a lot happens. Um, but we, we will, we will come back to the, the circle always, um, in silo. It always comes back to the cycle. Amber Temple Morphine Layson and one other project that is very close to your heart uh, as the day of today is called Moxie. Can you tell us a little bit more about it and also about the powerful symbol uh, surrounding uh, this idea of representation? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Moxie is one of those pro you know, those projects that came to me, I say stories find you. Um, it's my collaborator from Hawkeye, the writer, Heather Quinn. And, um, and it's, <laughs> it's on the surface, it's a superhero film. It's a, it's a lo-fi superhero like the boys or like Deadpool. You know, she's got attitude. She's kick-ass. She's funny. She's got moxie is what she's got. 
But as we, uh, there was something about it. I can't put my finger on it. I was like, why do we need to tell this story? And I always feel we need to have a reason to tell a story. Like it's got to have some kind of consequence. So on its surface, it's hugely entertaining, fun, you know, romp through, through LA and through the world and about this woman who is, you know, dealing with, with guilt from something that happened when she was at college. Um, and then being, being, being picked out of this kind of hero and this, this symbol of the city. And the discussion is, well, she doesn't look like our hero. She doesn't look like we expected it to because everyone else in the program are, are, are men. Um, and what we discovered, not only is this important to, to, to have heroes that don't only look like one thing, but what I realized is there, there isn't a, you know, a fun superhero film that's led by an African American woman who's kick ass and funny and has attitude and speaks her mind. And, you know, we've had other versions of it, but not, not the entertainment version. I'm like, why hasn't this happened? So I want, you know, Kiki Palmer, and I'm so lucky is playing Moxie and she's just magnificent. And I, and I want that. I want that representation. I want, I want that, this, this, this crazy ride to, to be for, for men and women and no matter where you're from, just to enjoy the film, just enjoy it. And what people will take away, whether they realize it or not, is like, is that thing of either I haven't seen that or I haven't seen someone like me up on screen doing that. So it's really important to tell this film. It has consequence in that way. It has a lot of hope. Um, there's an, there's a powerful emotional drive through it, but at the end of the day, it's, um, it's important and it's an important human story to tell. So I couldn't be more excited about it. Um, I hope, you know, into next year, uh, we can move it forward. Um, and also I get to blow shit up. So it is a win-win situation. <laughs> it is a win-win situation. And in conclusion, you want that representation. Thank you very much, uh, Amber Louise Templemore Finlayson. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it's, it's great to talk about this stuff. It's great to talk about stories that we want to tell and get out into the world, um, but also stories that are important while being entertaining. Very important. Um, but thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this. <laughs>